know that we still probably have a couple of people that are trying to make their way in, but we're going to get started. So I want to thank everyone for coming out this evening. We all understand the importance of family, and we're hoping and promising to make, make sure that this meeting tonight is efficient and, and as informative as we can make it. Uh, before we get started, I just wanted to introduce a few people that are here with us tonight, um, and I'm going to take a few minutes for that. We're going to start off with uh, our commissioner, Al Petrako. He's in the audience somewhere. Okay, he's over here at the Hand Bar. We're going to move over to the uh, Nutley Board of Education. We have Charlie Kaczynski. We have Lisa. We have Lisa Danchek Park. I believe she may not be here tonight, but we're going to recognize her because she is definitely one of the team. Uh, Sal Ferraro. Sal Valcano. Ryan Klein. Wendy Sherman. Greg Scalero. Vice President Wendy Russo. Myself, Andy Barnasar. Our board administrator, Karen Yates. We also have a former GOE member, John Capone. Where is he? Oh, there he is. <laughs> uh, we also have from the NEF, the President, Lorraine Kaczynski. And from the Nully Schools, we have our superintendent, Dr. Julie Blazer. <laughs> Both of our directors of curriculum, Campania, and Janine Ogunsoa. <laughs> our director of communication, Karen Greco. <laughs> our Washington principal, Doug Jones. <laughs> and our middle school principal, Tracy Egan. Our assistant band director, Vincent Vicarello, is in the back. <laughs> From our technology, we have Andrew Levine and Ian B. Meister. <laughs> and I heard a little rumor that there might be some Washington staff here. <laughs> back 
by prioritizing what we believe to be the most responsible, cost-efficient, sustainable, and most importantly, student impactful. So we as a community can continue to build on the educational success, not, of the, not only of the last six years, but to reinforce our educational infrastructure for decades to come. Tonight, you're gonna to hear from our superintendent of schools, Dr. Julie Glazer, and her discussion is we'll cover the space needs within our district, as well as what will help our students academically, socially, and emotionally. Next on the agenda, you'll hear from our architectural firm, the Karen Marino, and they will explain the conceptual draft drawings of the four schools discussed amongst this board. And then Karen Gaines, our business administrator, will walk you through potential impacts and costs associated with conceptual designs. After the presentation, we have a lot of time for questions and answers and what I hope to be a robust discussion. It's important that questions and ideas are shared so that we, together as a community, can work to move forward. And now at this time, I'd like to introduce our superintendent of schools, Dr. Julie Blake. that we can 
to address the overcrowding, to enhance academic rigor, and to maintain the neighborhood culture and walking community that's contributed not only to the charm of the town, but to stable home values. To simply articulate the reason we're here tonight, to discuss the projects that we, as a Nutley School District, are currently at educational capacity. And what that means is not the fire code occupancy that you see on the wall over there, but as I was saying, the available space for the effective delivery of instruction. Many of you already know, because you were here and living through it, that I had to add sections in August to <coughs> the last two available classrooms in the district. By not adding on to our buildings, we face several realities. We remain overcrowded. It will only worsen as the enrollment projections continue to grow. Our class sizes will increase in every single elementary school. The trailers here in Atlantico remain as permanent structures, which was not the intent. And more trailers need to be added over time to house the additional students. And that could happen as soon as 2021 if the projections are correct. Additionally, the district will <coughs> face moderate redistricting, again here at Washington, also at Yantico and Spring Garden, and that's just to accommodate the elementary school students. Last year, as a walking district, we had 131 requests for students not to attend their home school for a whole variety of reasons, but I was forced to deny many of those requests for this year, and I will have to do the same for next year as well. We've already closed sections, class sections, here at Washington, also at Yantico and Lincoln. So any new students who are registered in the district, new families who are moving into Nutley, may have to attend a school other than their home school or their neighborhood school. And that would also have to continue with the increased class size. You have no idea how difficult it is to call a family, and this has happened to me twice in the last three weeks, who just very excitedly closed on their new home and is ready to register their children, say at Lincoln School, and I have to tell them, I'm sorry, your children can't walk to school. We don't have space for both of them at Lincoln. You'll have to drive them to Spring Garden. Or then to face the parents at the Spring Garden PTO meeting when they ask me how much their class size is going to continue to rise. Dr. Glazer, we love welcoming the new families. The children are wonderful to have in our classrooms. But we were at 18 kids in the class a couple weeks ago. We're coming up on 20. How long is it until we have 23, 25? I can't answer that question. The numbers are going to continue to rise. I'm also going to tell you that we have parents who struggle to drive their children to two different schools. We try and help accommodate them with the extended day program. But again, that's a hardship that should not happen when you're living in a community with neighborhood schools. People say to me all the time, and I do mean all the time, will it really matter if there's 26 or 28 or 30 kids in a classroom? Yes, it does. It absolutely does, especially at kindergarten through third grade. But beyond the instruction, think about the space. Think about just all of you sitting in here side by side. With 26 or 30 desks in a classroom, you lose that room space that we just came to value with the new reading and writing workshop model. We lose the centers that we just learned how valuable they were for kids to have experiential learning. There's just no space for that when you have that many desks and that many kids in a room. Our academics will suffer. So, let's get to the proposed project so you can see what it is that we're uh, bringing to you. The top priority of the Nutley Public Schools is to provide the very best education for our students. So, the first thing that we're proposing is supporting the move of all of our sixth graders out of the five elementary schools into the middle school, bringing up three to four classrooms in each elementary school, and making the John Walker Middle School a true middle school, sixth grade through eighth grade. The middle school project includes um, you can see some of the pictures up here, includes the addition of 20 classrooms, cafeteria and service kitchen, multi-purpose room, toilet facilities, a secure entrance, and the reconfiguration of the office wing. And that is the main office wing of the middle school, not the board offices. They remain in the basement, unrenovated. 
There are many, many benefits to the middle school model. I think you've heard many of those um, over the last few years as we've moved to teaming. But just briefly, I'm going to remind you that with targeted instruction, which means teachers specializing in the content areas, the rigor of instruction is enhanced. Placing our sixth graders in the middle school allows them some more independence. Our teaming and advisory structure can be used to really focus on individual student needs and allows us to further personalize and individualize instruction for students. Additionally, our sixth graders identify a lot more with the seventh and eighth graders than they do with the elementary students. And from a human growth and development standpoint, they do a better job with kids that are more of their own age. Also, and importantly, our students would be exposed to a lot of areas of specialization at an earlier age, so they have an opportunity to explore and develop interests that might feed into them in high school. They're provided opportunities to use specialized facilities like the science labs, the robotic space, industrial arts and job classes that they couldn't have access to in the elementary school. I can keep going, but I'll tell you that more of the benefits are detailed on the Frequently Asked Questions sheet and on the tab of the website that is dedicated to this project. It can call, and the expansion includes six classrooms, a multi-purpose room with a kitchen, additional toilet facilities, the relocation of the main office from the second floor down to a secure entrance. In this case, the addition um, of the classrooms and the removal of the sixth grade will allow us to eliminate the trailers at the Cross School. Here at Washington, see Washington up there, the expansion includes a three-story addition, also of six classrooms, also toilet facilities and an elevator, allowing us to reach all of our students and also allowing us to eliminate the trailers here at Washington School. At the high school, and I don't know if you can see that picture, but that's a picture of our students having PE class in the hallway. At the high school, there's a critical need for additional physical education and multi-use space. In addition to that, a renovation of our media center and TV studio space. The current media center would be renovated, allowing us to create four additional classrooms and common learning areas, um, and a space for um, the PE. This is the level of overcrowding that we're experiencing all over the district and all of our schools. We have programming taking place, and you saw those pictures even here at Washington, taking place in undersized rooms, spaces that might not be the most conducive for learning. We're using every single available space, even those that weren't even initially designed for academic learning spaces. This board, previous administration and previous boards, the community, we've all been studying this and preparing for this. We've known it was coming. We've reached a point now where it's no longer coming. These students are already here. The issues are here. And before I turn everything over to our architects to look at the um, conceptual plans, while well, I have the microphone, I feel the need to say that if we don't do the proposed construction projects, if we continue to wait and see what the effect is going to be, the effect on our academic program and our educational reputation are going to cause your property values to go down an awful lot more than your taxes are going to go up. What we're asking you to do is to invest in the future of Nutley, to invest in your town. At this time, I'd like to introduce Mr. Joe DeCaro from the Carol Rubino Architects. had an issue with that and I'm sure you can appreciate the security concerns of even publishing proposed plans. So we do thank you for complying. The drawings are available in each of the schools as well as the board offices if you'd like to review them more in depth or see them more up close for yourself. Thank you very much. It's, it's wonderful to see the amount of people that are out tonight. As Dr. Glazer said, we've been involved with the district for many years in developing 
plans, options, costs, give the board of education uh, information so that they can start to make certain decisions. Over that time period, we come to a concept plan that we want to present tonight. Uh, the direction was to take the sixth grade population out of the elementary school and move it to the middle school. In doing that, we had to accommodate approximately 20 class, uh, 17 classrooms for the housing of students and three additional classrooms for special ed and other, other spaces. Uh, this is a graphic of the uh, middle school. Uh, the white area depicted on the site plan is the existing building. Uh, just to orientate everybody, uh, this is Franklin Ave at the bottom. Uh, we have the uh, main entrance in this location the auditorium, the cafeteria, and the gymnasium in the, in the back with access to parking off to this side. So in, in looking at this facility, we have to add basically almost a school. We bring the total sixth grade over, 20 classrooms, plus the other spaces that need to be accommodated for those students. That's a multi-purpose room slash gym, cafeteria, and other spaces within that. So just graphically, the white is the existing, the yellow portion is the extension of the addition that we have to add. So we're adding a school within a school. I have too many clips. The, the first level indicates the, the addition. Now, what I'd like to start with too is we examined uh, probably about uh, 15 different options on how to add the 20 classrooms. We looked at adding building over this parking area in this location. We looked at actually adding a building on top of the existing building. We looked at adding structures off to the side. And at one point, we looked at adding a huge addition out to the front of the building along Franklin Avenue. Right? A very dramatic proposal, but what we wanted to do was to examine every potential option on how to add Classroom to the facility. We did not want to leave any rock unturned uh, for the information from the district to make a good of class decisions. During that process, um, the town acquired the bicycle shop property on the left side of the building, as you're looking at it. That opened up a huge potential and different opportunities on how to add an addition in a cost effective Manner. As you can imagine, building on top of an existing building to acquire the 20 classrooms is a tough endeavor, constructability-wise and cost-wise. So the, the, the opportunity to get this property was a tremendous benefit in how we could add to this facility. The, lo the, first, the lower level, this is the level uh, where the existing board office kind of sort of in that space. A little hard to see from the back. But that's the existing board office. The main entrance is in this location. So what we did is off to the side, we ran a corridor, and we added classrooms with, with the various stairs and toilet facilities. The main level, uh, if you look at, this is the entrance with the steps coming up to the platform to the entrance. What we've done is we've duplicated that entrance off to the left side which would be the entrance to the new facility. So we have the access coming up, which is actually enter the first floor, basically a half a mile off from, from the uh, sidewalk. So we have all the ADA compliance and accessibility to the facility. And in this location, we re um, renovated the existing administration area to provide the secure entrance of meeting all the security issues today when we build a new school. So it would meet up-to-date code requirements. So this would be the vestibule, lockable vestibule, um, the administration area where they come in, and then they get released to either go into the, the school or go down directly to the administration to the Board of Ed office. Okay. Now what we've done is, because of the population, we have to add a cafeteria to house those students because the existing cafeteria would be large enough to house the incoming sixth grade. Plus, it was a concept to keep the sixth grade semi-isolated, mixed when you wanted to, and flexibility. So we tried to look carefully in terms of how we orientate and organize the school, not just sticking classrooms on one end, that it works. 
So we added a, an additional cafeteria that would be adjacent to the original one. As we continue up uh, toward the site, uh, we have an expanded kitchen and new receiving that was being received for the entire project. That would be your, your trash deliveries, your deliveries, all those elements tucked into this service drive along the left side of the addition. The upper level along the side of the classrooms like we did on the lower level. And then as, if you're familiar with the site, the grade along Franklin is lower than the top. You enter at one level, and then if you go up to the second floor, you're at the first level on that rear side, which would have access to the gym that you're familiar with. So what we would do on the second level, we have classrooms, and then get toward the back of the building, we come out on grade, and that's where we would place the new gym multi-purpose room. With changing areas and access to toilets. What we've done is we've created that new lobby that would serve both the existing gym and the new gym, and it would be able to section off the remaining part of the building. So for rec, night activities, you can access the building in a secure way that you can shut the building off, still have access to toilets, things like that, that you can function, and it's a very organized plan. So if you, if you look at the overall plan, and if we were going to design a new middle school, this size population. If you look at the organization of it, it would be very similar. We have circulation, we have the large areas where they need to be related to the students, and you also have organization around the building when you want to. You can kind of separate the buildings and keep them together as you wish. So we looked at it in 
So that did away with that, but we do have a structure there. So anywhere you're demolishing <coughs> something to build something costs a lot more money. So in the course of the evaluation, and Dr. Glazer mentioned that it was up to uh, almost $98 million, the district pared this down in the review and the evaluation of what was being presented to them. So we looked at the most efficient uh, location to put six classrooms. And what we came up with, and this is this is the main parking area here, the main entrance. Uh, we came in over here. So at the end of this corridor, to the stair tower, we would remove that and place a two-classroom addition on that level. So you can see, just based on the sheer size, I'll go to the next plan, which shows in a little larger area. We added two classrooms and extended the stair tower again. So the amount of square footage that you're building are mostly classroom space. You're not building a lot of corridor or circulation space to get to those classrooms. They cost just as much as building a classroom. So we want to keep the square footage down as much as possible. We also have additional toilets that will be served off the corridors as well as for the students. And it will be kind of located here in a very concise manner. The other level, the second and third level, are identical to that. And based on some of the classrooms that are adjacent, we have to make some slight modifications. We'll have questions right after, <coughs> so you can ask any and all questions and I'll answer everything for you. The, um, the other class, the other building that we looked at was the high school. Again, um, needed additional capacity uh, for students. Uh, quick orientation, uh, the Franklin Ave, the main entrance to the building by the uh, auditorium, the gym, parking in the back, classroom wings here and here on the upper level. If I can go all the way up. What we looked at, again, we looked at all the uh, spaces within each facility, how it's utilized and conditions. On the third level, there's the existing multimedia center or whole library. Uh, unfortunately, that media center has a car that runs through because you, the students access this lane all the way through this. So there's a lot of wasted space and inefficient space. What we, what we proposed was take that library out or the media center out and construct four classrooms within that space. Right? And those could be used for uh, STEM labs, technology related facilities. Small group construction, four small groups, uh, to allow the teaching uh, philosophy there, and what's called the maker space, which is a common area where students can break out of classrooms and use that area. And that would pick up additional capacity for the high school. In order to do that, you'd have to then relocate the media center, and that's being proposed to be built out along Franklin Avenue between the music wing and the gymnasium in front of the auditorium. We then looked at other possible ways of where you could add additional classrooms. Um, during that period, we looked at building, because again, we're kind of right at the property line, we looked at building over the uh, section of this building, we looked at building over this section, we looked at ripping out the music area, and rebuilding it, I even at one time suggested that we infill some of the courtyard in the high school. Which I still have some holes in my back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Suggestion. So we, we eliminated that from the office. The other area that we found after kind of going through it in the dialogue back and forth, we saw that there was an area on the side by like just taking down the stair and setting it over that we could put a three story addition. Um, in that kind of, not kind of taking over the entire parking area. It's a very clean, concise way to put an addition. So what we did is we looked at it and said, well, we need to address um, the physical education. So we provided an area that's off of the locker rooms and the artillery gyms to create a multi-faceted, multi-use, two phys ed spaces that could be used for a variety of functions over the years to meet the program. We then wanted to develop a space that in the future if you needed something else that 
this first level addition was capable to support the second and third level on top <coughs> with relative ease. So we built in the location for the elevator, the uh, the district needs more space. They're going to look back and say, you know, 30 years ago, they did the right thing and they made this ability to add on. And that's what we, what we want to do. So we developed those, those options. Uh, these are some photographs of some progress that we've worked on in the past um, in other districts. Uh, this shows the new concept of a team lab that would be included. Uh, some of the potential uh, ways that we could handle the new gyms multi-purpose rooms that we proposed. Uh, again, some cafeterias. Uh, and then the new uh, learning commons that would be in the middle of the high school as well as the, uh, the media center. So with that, I'd like to introduce Karen Yamas who will go over the uh, process. Thank you, John. and the administration decided that the district needed to take a new direction. We could no longer look at just the current needs, but we needed to begin to plan for the future. That direction started with the development of the strategic plan. This plan has guided the academic and programming changes, communication, and the development of the district's annual budget. One of the board's financial goals has been to look at the need for future capital projects while being mindful of the impact that these projects should have on the taxpayers of numbers. The board has been diligently building its capital reserve fund, and the Board of Education is committing $2.4 million of those capital reserve funds to the project to be presented this evening. This investment will reduce the total amount for bonding to $66.5 million. At this time, I'd like to do a review of each of the cost estimates for the project. So again, at the middle school, this total project is $36.7 million and includes the 20 classrooms, the cafeteria and service kitchen, the multi-purpose room, toilet facilities, the secure entrance, and the reconfiguration of the main office wing. <laughs> at Yamcaw School, the project cost is $15.6 million. For the six classrooms, the multi-purpose room with a kitchen. This kitchen will allow the cafeteria to begin cooking right out of the Antiquot School and service possibly spring garden, which will then provide an ease at the high school for the preparation for the other three elementary schools so the food can be prepared later in the day and be more fresh when it's delivered to the students here at Lincoln Rasmus and at uh, Washington. The toilet facility, the relocation of the main office with the secure entrance, and the removal of the trailer. Here at Washington School, the project cost is $6.95 million, which includes the three-story addition of the six classrooms, toilet facility, the elevator, and again, the removal of the trailer. And lastly, at Nutley High School, the project cost is $8.95 million which is the additional physical education multi-purpose space, the renovation of the media center and TV studio, producing four additional classrooms and the common learning area, and the new media center developed to include the TV studio. So the total cost of our project is actually $68.9 million, with the district contributing $2.4 million from capital reserve total cost of bond is $66.5 million. What is the tax impact on the average homeowner? The average assessed value is $316,427. Again, that is on your assessed value of your home. The assessed value is assigned by the municipality and is used to calculate the base for property taxes. This is different than your market value, which is the value that someone would offer you if you were going to be selling your home. So on that average assessed home, the estimated tax impact in the first year is $183.50. 
the board has the opportunity to split the bond sale into two sales to help ease the impact on the taxpayer. Since we don't need the entire $66 million in the first year, since the project will take time to build and payments will be paid out over time as the work is completed. We are anticipating the first bond sale to take place in March of 2018. These figures are based on an interest rate of about 4.31%. Again, I cannot emphasize enough, these are estimates. At this time, no one has a crystal ball. We don't know what the market is going to be in 2018. Uh, we are trying our best working with our financial advisors to give you a number that is as meaningful as we possibly can. This number is also based upon the aid that we will receive from the Department of Education. The plans will be reviewed by the Department of Education once they are finalized by the Board of Ed. And at that point, they will come back to us and tell us how much we will get in what they call debt service aid. We are being very conservative with our estimate at this point of 10% aid on the entire project. We're hopeful that that number will be much larger. And at that point, once we have a better idea and the letter from the state telling us what we will receive, these numbers will be revised. And at this point, I'm going to turn things back to Dr. Blazer, who will go through the timeline. So, Our hope for outcome is to continue with our town hall meetings. And I would also like to tell you that if you are a member of a community group, a neighborhood organization, actually any kind of group that you would like us to come and speak to, we are happy to do that. We've been saying that for the last three nights, and I actually am pretty happy to say we've already scheduled three or four more. So my dance card is filling up. It gives me something to do every night. So look around your communities. Um, your neighborhoods and see um, where we can come and tell you even more and you can um, ask your questions that are specific to your own neighborhood or your own organization. We're going to continue to gather feedback through these town halls, those kind of community meetings. The board's going to continue um, with your feedback and um, input to refine the plans with the architects. Then when we have all of those things together at a closed board meeting, closed session on February 13th, we'll come together to discuss um, what we've learned from the community, what we can see from the architects to be able to refine those plans into something that we can finalize the um, expected date for voting if we're going to move forward will be February 27th at the regular board meeting. Then, that's where all the fun begins, then the town would need to move forward with a referendum for the bonding. As um, Karen said, $66.5 million. The first available date that the state would allow us to vote as a community is September 2017. It would be the end of September, I promise. We won't bring you back from the shore, or do it over the summer or Labor Day. We'll wait for everybody. And then, um, if that and when that, I'll say when, because it's really a need, passes, the idea would be for construction to begin in June 2018, with the expectation that students would be in new classroom spaces by September 2020. So, um, moving relatively quickly. Before um, I open it up for questions again, we are very mindful of the fact that sometimes people need to go. There is information out in the hall for you uh, to take away frequently <coughs> questions and that email address to send questions if you aren't allowed to stay for your babysitters or other family needs. There's post-it notes out there if you want to write a question. And um, are we going to go with the microphone or are we going to hand up? Okay, so we're going to try and start. We'll see how this goes because we know it's close quarters. There is a microphone up front. If people are interested in asking questions, we'd like you to please come to the microphone. The same way that we do with any board meeting, um, we're going to ask that you please keep your comments to about two minutes. Um, and we will, um, Karen will um, continue to add to our pad over there, frequently asked 
questions. We'll continue to update those frequently asked questions and answers and post them and post them on the um, website and um, to update those forms. So Are we ready for our questions? I think we are. You are the first so question asker in the microphone. So. Yeah. Um, my son goes to Washington. My daughter will start here next year. In looking at what's oh, there, um, I just need you to, to start again because you were talking up here. We're sorry. <laughs> I, I have a son who's in third grade at Washington, and the daughter will start kindergarten um, next year. In seeing what's there, um, one of the concerns I have being here is I look at a plan where the middle school is getting new cafeteria, I see multi-purpose rooms, I only see classrooms, and I coach rec now in town. I see our gym. I see where our kids in this school are eating lunch. I do not want for my kids and 30 years from now to create a have and have not in this town. Uh, if I'm going to sell my house and property values or something important to with the schools, why would I buy if my kid goes sending my kid to Washington, when I'm going to see gymnasiums, multi-purpose rooms, and another part of town? I, I think the the staff here needs that. I I'm a teacher. I don't know how the education teachers do much in that gym. And looking forward, I just know how can I vote for something when what I look at it is I'm going to be the have not and my children will be. When I look at that plan, and I know that the middle school needs a full school, and I'm fully supportive of that, but the amount of money I'm getting a few classrooms, and my son will still be eating lunch in that cafeteria, if you want to call it. Or the classroom, or right, thank, you. thank you. We're going to ask um, Jody Carroll, our architect, to talk to you a little bit about the different options we looked at. Um, I don't know if um, Danny wants to weigh in too, but sir, I want you to know that our original, we took all the needs, right? Every identified need that the board, previous administration, has collected over a period of years. All of those needs added up to more than $100 million, and in the final, what we were willing to look at, $96 million, which was an untenable amount of money, as I'm sure you can understand. So as we looked at all the options, as we looked at what were um, needs that we could actually fund and bond for, that's where our architects were able to come up with how many? 30? Where did you guys all 30, 40 different options for this? At least 30 or 40 different options that we waded through. So I'm going to let um, Joe just talk to you a little bit about Washington specifics. Classroom addition and 
the multi-purpose room was ten, ten and a half million dollars. Additionally, no, no, total.
whole nutley, not a Washington or a Oh, I know that. It was just sold in our mind. I understand. And, and again, that's not my lens. Okay? So as I come into this process, I have the tools in front of me of a demographer's report and community studies over the last six years. And I understand and I can hear your frustration for your kids and what this is doing and what that's doing. We literally looked at projections based on a formula from the professionals that we hired of what the numbers will out the six classrooms in each school. From there, there are other formulas and projections. I need Joe for that to explain to you how that comes up. But you do, as this gentleman recognized, we're moving 300 kids out of the elementary schools to the middle school. We do need to be able to to feed them and house them in spaces. All of your sixth graders are coming out of Washington School. They're also, that, so that's freeing up three to four classrooms right there, additional space. And even with the projections of students and the addition of six classrooms, less students. You have an opportunity, Mr. Jones, I don't know where, oh, there you are, an opportunity to do a different kind of lunch schedule, a different kind of schedule. But I want Joe to talk about how we come up with the space utilization. Well, the, the way it's figured out is you take the existing number of classrooms that are used for basically uh, overall occupancy. You look at the class size policy, whether it's 22, 19, 24, uh, you take the population per grade level, not total population, but the population per grade level. Then you basically divide that into the, the class size policy, and that'll give you the number of sections per grade, pre-K, K, first, second, third, fourth. Then you identify the spaces as classrooms. Then you also look at your program areas for art, music, or science, anything else you want to have special education. So you come up with a number for your program, and you come up with a number for your population, how you solve, solve your population. Each section will have a certain number of classrooms. That determines your size of your building and the requirements. Then you look at your lunch periods, your gym, the number of periods you have, and the population and the seating that would go into each one of those functions. And you can serve different things, two periods, 20, how long your lunch periods are, and that's how you determine the basic core elements and the size of the facility. So it, it still doesn't make sense to me because if we have more children in our school than Yanikaw does, and I'm just using them as a comparison right now, and we have more children that stay in as opposed to what they do. We're just a bigger facility in general. We don't have a kitchen. Their food is in a hot box. The food is horrible. It comes cold or it's not there. I mean, everybody's gonna sit here and agree in regards to the food. Again, it didn't answer the question as to why are they getting a multi-purpose room and a full kitchen, and we can't even get a multi-purpose room, period. So again, based on utilization, but as Danny said, this isn't an architectural decision. That's just the formula that's used. That's what we use to look at the, the usage and to build the budget. The final determination, as Danny said, comes down to looking at everything, and it will be a board decision and a community decision, right? It has to be, you know, to, to do this, something has to get cut somewhere, or the decision has to be made to, to grow. And those are the reasons why we're doing these town halls and conversations to get that input. Yeah, it should definitely be considered because it's, it's, a, it's a big, it's a big thing for our school right now. Why are we getting exactly? Why are we getting cut as opposed to here? Why are we cut? Like, why are they? They have 15 million. They're getting to the school. It's not looking at we're getting six and they're getting six. Okay, that's it. 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 That's it.
we want to make sure that this is a productive and friendly conversation. To be clear, everything is prioritized on the list. It's not this is what Washington gets or this is what Yanacaw gets. This is this is the number of students, this is the number of spaces, this is the, the demographics. There is nothing that we're talking about or presenting that isn't just a concept at this point. There's nothing that is delineated or cut in that way. And I think that, um, I, again, I heard your frustration when you were talking about comments made previously. I, I can't overcome no, 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 I understand but, that. But I'm going to say, in my experience, my short experience, the board has spent a tremendous amount of time looking at this, studying it, trying to bring the best solutions forth for the whole community. If we didn't want to hear what you had to say, we wouldn't be doing this every night. So please have some confidence that the board is trying to address all the needs. Karen's writing down all of the comments. And I think that we've absolutely heard this, heard the cafeteria, heard the multi-purpose room, and hopefully we can move on to hear some other kinds of questions, comments, or questions. I just have one other, one other question. Um, regarding the, the, the old boiler room and the boiler system and, and what have you over there, why can't that be put into this referendum? And I understand it's a big expense. But over the course of these years, it's, you know, like, like we were saying before, how much could that possibly add up to? Removing the items that are in there and removing all of that stuff. And again, I know it's a cost, but if you remove all of that, that picks up more space for us down the line to either put the multi-purpose room if we do not get that and that doesn't pass on this end, um, to do that. And then lastly, and you can answer it in any order you want, if this referendum doesn't pass, what is your next option? What happens if this does not go through and this does not pass? What happens? Because next year we have to come up with another classroom for next year, and we don't know how we're coming up with just one classroom because we're teaching in closets and in hallways as it is. So what do we do then? I know you're telling me what I said, and I did start here. If we continue to look or wait or we don't consider this proposed construction as a real need, what happens is increased class sizes, keeping these trailers, adding additional trailers, making sure that um, not only are sections closed, but kids aren't at their neighborhood schools, the waivers have to be denied. It's an unpleasant situation. I don't believe, again, from listening to the community members, the charm of this town is in your neighborhoods, is in your schools, is in, is in all of the things that you've created over time and tradition. So if it doesn't pass, we're, we're in a reality of um, not, not what you've had up until now. So another, well, I'm just going to just finish up one of the questions there. I know we, we, have, we have touched upon the uh, the area where the decommissioned boiler is at this point. Um, and that was actually one of the areas that we had looked at as far as doing the expansion on to, to add the additional space. And the architect probably had a couple comments to this as well. The area beneath there, which is the old golden, those areas have to, those areas have to be, everything has to be pulled out, it has to be back built. So there's a lot of things that have to be done to repair the area to accept another building of that size. So when we look at those costs, that's one of the challenges. You know, we can take, if you look at the picture, we can take that section of those classrooms and we can probably move them all the way around the building and find a good spot for them. The problem is that when we try to put it on the ground that's underneath that, or the things that we're going to tamper with below that, we start to realize that we're going to get the thermal stuff on certain areas. Um, you know, we're going to have a base that's not going to be able to accept that without further reinforcement. So when we, when we look at this, and believe me, I, I, and, and I hear the frustration, and, and you know, I, I hope that you can see it in my face that I hear the frustration, but we're trying to, this is a district-wide problem, um, and we would not in any way, shape, or form that we feel that um, we were trying to shortchange anyone in this process. And this, and, and again, this is something that the board's gonna have to go back and we're gonna have to really sit down and we're gonna have to talk about, because again, 
trying to keep everything from a financial perspective in balance with what our needs are, we have to keep that comfort zone. But if it gets too far away from us, the success in September is going to be dependent on what this final number looks like. Because it's not just our students. We have, you know, I don't know if Dr. Bozier mentioned this, but we have 50% or 60% of the population that are, are, have other concerns. It's not about the, the, the schools at this point. They're concerned about being taxed out of the community. So we have a big challenge here. And, and, and this is the reason why we didn't take a year and come on out and, and present. This is something that's been going on for six years. So I just want everyone to be mindful of that. If the architect, I don't know if you wanted to make any comments on the, the, the other. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, my, uh, my son and daughter are both in a class of roughly 23 students. Yes. And your plan is called for six classes. And by moving the sixth graders, we're going to have an additional four classes. Are there any plans to try to reduce class sizes and use some of those resources for that? Yes, that's the purpose. Okay, and my next question real quick is, uh, think of projection for population growth. We're taking into consideration in the plans. I think with the six classes, putting in roughly 20 students, and the other four, 20 out of eight, it's roughly 200 students. I think the architect, I'm sorry, I don't want to call your name. The architect mentioned that the plans were for 30 year population growth. We're going to use those 200 students in those classes much more sooner than the 30 years that you calculate into your plans. Are we gonna be revisiting this maybe seven, eight years down the road, or we're gonna need more space again? So according to the demographer's report, and the formula he uses is actual students and actual homes, plus the available information that we have about any new construction or new um, properties that are being approved. So based on that, we have over the next 10 years, we're able to see what the population growth is. This isn't a bubble that's coming in now. This is a group of students who are growing up through our school system. And he was very confident. Um, and I know that the architects worked with the demographer's report to say that this is a solution for 15 or 20 years. The biggest thing that I've heard in all of these meetings and all of the community meetings is don't come back to us. Give us a solution that's going to be 15, 20, 30 years because we can't afford for you to come back to us in seven years. So we spent a lot of time and effort to make sure that we have the best information possible that this is a long-term solution and that based on the projections, um, number one, that we are adding enough classrooms for that long term. But number two, as Joe, that's your architect, um, detailed in the plans, as they've been developing all of these spaces, that there are flexible options. So that down the road, whatever we build is able to be added on to. I covered that too. <laughs> as a note, that the monitor's report is on. Um, I don't really have, I see what the plan is, and I'm here to basically say, I, my son is in the sixth grade, he's in the trailer right now, my daughter is in the third grade. I know something has to happen to the school, of course. Being in the school, since my son is in kindergarten, being involved in PTO for every year except one, I have watched these teachers with a smile on their face, work out of closets, work out of Hallways means that no one would really ask any teacher to do it. And they come in every single day with a smile on their face, and they're proud. They're proud to be teachers at Washington School, and I'm proud to be a mom, and I'm proud to be on the PTO. And I would just wish that you would take one more look to see if there's any way that we can get our children out of the gym, eating lunch, where 
they're afraid to finish their lunch because they don't have enough time. They don't have enough time. But I, I will say that with fewer students, your lunch schedule should look different. And that's what I was saying, um, and I lost Mr. Jones again. But that's, that's one of the things that we're looking at in every building. You're, you're facing having 10 extra classroom spaces, so an opportunity to do a different lunch schedule so kids don't feel that rush, so they don't have that issue. I'm not saying that you don't need a, a separate gym or cafeteria, but we are looking at it in other ways, including the schedule. I would hate to see this not pass because there's angry parents. So I, I just want to say something because I don't want to be defensive against everybody, but the current situation that we're in, they don't have a proper lunchroom. So taking away 94 sixth graders, we've gone up at least 50 students each year. So next year, taking away 60, 94 sixth graders, is only 44 kids. 44 kids got them still kindergarten meeting in their classroom. They still don't have the space. So taking away the children doesn't help anything. And in two years from now, we'll probably be up 100 kids because we're going up 50 kids each year as it goes on. So it doesn't, it's not like we're projecting it to be bad. It's already bad. Like we already have, we watched our kids go from 30 minutes to 20 minutes and be rushed and feel rushed. And it's just, I know your lens is different than ours, but in our lens, we've had board members stand up and say, well, Spring Garden has a uh, science lab that they can't get rid of, but you guys have to have art in your hallway. So in our lens, we've stood here for year after year, watching everyone say, Spring Garden gets this. I bought a home and their home values are higher on Spring Garden side than they are on ours because the school they say is better. We don't believe it and we don't want it to be that way, but I would hate for something like this to stand in the way of the 500 plus families that come to this school voting yes for this. So I feel like there needs to be something that makes everyone in this room and everyone in this school district just feel a little bit better about it because right now we're all left a little unsettled.
Um, I know that the development that is going on in town that we're seeing and, and the uncertainty of what Hoffman the Roche looks like and what that's going to look like 10, 15 years from now, um, I think that's a challenge for all of us because I, I don't know if the commissioners know exactly what that looks like. I know we don't know exactly what that looks like. But what I want to really focus on tonight is to make sure that us as a community, with all this uncertainty that's wrapping around this community, the one thing that we are certain of is we, we see what's happening here. This is the one thing, as we as board members and us as a community, we have some control here right now that, that's going to be able to sustain <coughs> some of the impacts that are going to be coming from what Roche eventually looks like and what some of the other developments are going to look like. So when we calculated these numbers, it, we were very, very sensitive to the fact of our capacity. And then when I say capacity, I don't talk about the Anacol, I'm not talking about Washington, I'm talking about addiction, our student capacity throughout. This plan is going to help absorb a lot of what's going to be coming in the future. We, we have that set. We make sure of that. Now, is it perfect? No, because unfortunately, the longer it goes out, the more challenge we have with the demand on students. You know, we don't know that. I mean, the demographer said that to us. The further you go out, the less correct this projection gets, because it's just too long of a period of time. And the ebbs and flows that are going through nothing. We've had a tremendous turnover in single-family homes in the district. So if you look over the past few years, we're talking about hundreds of homes that have been turning over. And they're coming in not planning a family, they're coming in with a family. So we have to support that. As a district, we have to support that. And I know to have a sustainable community, number one, we have to have a good school district. If we're going to be sustainable, we have to have a good school district. And everything, all the work that we've done, the efforts of the teachers, the efforts that the board has done, the change in curriculum, Everything that we've done to bring us to now, the outcome is, is we, we've been doing such a good job that people are coming. And they're coming with their family. We're not, they're not planning a family here. They're bringing them. And that's not a bad thing, but we need to prepare ourselves for that. And this is what this is about. Because if we don't, if we don't prepare now in a proactive position, the outcomes are not good. And we've talked about that. Next year, the year after, more modules, and we're going to continue to be reactive. We're going to throw money at, and useless money. We're going to put it out to just try to sustain something that we knew two years prior was here. So when I talk to everyone, we have to be mindful of that. I get it. The community. There's other things going around us. There really is. What happens with Roche? What's happening with the development? For us as a board, it's not a control. It's, not, it's just not. So on our end, we almost have to make sure that we're doing our part correctly because we want to make sure that we can absorb what's going to happen that way. Thank you. I just have a question about actually how it's going to be while the construction is going on. Um, I, I mean, with the trailers, it was supposed to take place over a certain period of time. They, did, they weren't actually ready until, I don't know, almost October. So things, you know, we're still going to have the, the sixth grade here while all of this construction is going on. Um, and then you're going to be putting a, a structure next to, you know, that area that has adjacent classrooms to the new building. How is that going to affect the students while the construction is going on? And in the sixth grade, it hasn't been moved yet. Um, you know, and then it's going to actually diminish the space even more because there's limited space over on this side. I was just trying to figure out how the logistics of the whole thing, how, the, how is that going to work? Yeah, the architect's going to kind of walk you through that. We're going to do that very carefully. Um, but the idea is, as I mentioned, the development plan to look at the construction of how you can build things while students and teachers are in the development. The plan is that construction will start uh, once, it's going to be a two year process for the entire district. Uh, we want to move back to the first summer after the drawings are done and bidding. During that first summer when the building is less occupied or not occupied, we move certain students into certain areas. We would do the major work, the foundations, the steel, uh, and the access, uh, and utility connections. Then basically the area gets fenced off and all the work gets consolidated to one area. All right. The contractors will be limited to where they have access to the site. Uh, where they can have access uh, within the building and around the building and at different hours. So it's plugged into the plans and specifications with very tight uh, requirements for construction. During the year, there will be construction. There 
it will be, we will see it, we will hear it. Right? A lot of the work will be come, will be happening after hours, and it will be work being done during the day. So one of the things we try to do, and we've done very successfully in the past, and the, the safety of the students and the occupants are the top priority in all the efforts during the summer. The contractor knows that, uh, everybody else knows that. In terms of the interference and the, and the, and the, the noise, uh, we work very carefully and the contractors work very carefully with the administration. Any testing, any certain activities, they spend certain work during those periods that are identified. Um, in terms of the safety, uh, all the contractors go through uh, screening. They have identification badges. These are, these are small things, but they all add up. So we look at how the site is secured, how the documents, where they can construct, when they can construct, and then it's going to go over that period. And then the final length or the connection will be done on the final summer where the students are at the building. So the trailers right now, the one trailer uh, during that first summer, there's cost to relocate that trailer and then being built based on the studies that we did and where it's going to be located. So it's accommodated in the overall cost. Just, just getting to that, will they be, because we need another classroom for next year, will you be adding another trailer? No plans to add another trailer. So where do we have the other fifth grade next year? We can't, we can't snap our fingers at all. No, I understand that, but I'm just asking because it's coming up. So where, where was that, where was that other classroom that would probably be coming out? Where would that be next year? You don't have a
So tell us what you need. Yeah, maybe Martha Stewart is not within our reach, but you know what? We have a lot of people here, we're professionals, and we're very good with our social media. Tell us what you need, and we will get it for you. Okay? It's a partnership. You can't do it alone. Thank you so much for saying so. We appreciate that. At this point in the process, right now, what we really need is this understanding and input. And after the board comes back and we can refine plans and make a decision if we're moving forward with the referendum, then we will meet all of you. And believe me, we will be reaching out to all of you. So thank you so very much. Thank you so very much. Thank you. 
we're going to have to work through that. I think that that's one of the things we're going to have to do. Well, I, I mean, I, I think that it's a structure to building. I think that you really need to consider the parking because it is a big issue right now. <laughs> Currently, I have continuous people parking in my parking lot during my patient office hours. I get phone calls from my tenants. Don't have parking in the evening if you have an event going on at the school. You know, so if you're gonna if you're gonna build a property, I am in no way against the school expansion. I think it's a wonderful thing, really. But along with the school expansion, you have to think of these things. It's important. When these parents come to an event for the school, for the children, where are they gonna park? Where is your staff going to park? I had two uh, substitute teachers approach me this week to ask me if they can park in my parking lot. Now, there's two other buildings there. They, one of the other uh, owners was not able to be here. He's got this. Yes, I'm here. Yes, I'm Oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Has there been any provisions made for pickup and 
drop off blame for the parents. Because currently, at 7.30 in the morning, quarter to eight, you can't come down Church Street. At 2.30, at 2.45, you cannot come down Church Street or Franklin Avenue. It creates a gridlock. So you're going to be adding more students there. So between Franklin and Church Street, it's, it's difficult. Anybody who's ever gone down Franklin Avenue, it's a nightmare. And so, I would like to see, as a property owner, a business owner, within walking distance, I would like to see a designated drop-off and pick-up. Because safety of the, of the kids, because currently, and some of the board members may know, currently they come through the parking lot, drive all the way through, and it's really, I mean, I'm security cameras, you can sit here all day and see it. I already had somebody crash into the building. And so, they were lucky because some, some of the kids sit on the back steps and have breakfast. And so they were, they were very lucky there was nobody sitting back there. I have one more question regarding taxes. So, you uh, mentioned the average homeowner taxes being assessed. Um, there was no mention of commercial. So, what does this mean to the commercial property owners? Because we seem to be getting hit with the most taxes. Yeah. Nobody calculated that. Well, That's important. Well, the reason I would like to see that, and I'm sure some of the other um, commercial property owners in town would like to see that as well. Thank you. Thank you.
that our demographer did take all of our rules, every single student, every single address. There were, I believe, uh, a certain number that were not um, that were not able to be identified. And we went to every single residence to verify. Okay. Every residence, and, and um, there were students that were just enrolled in some of our classes, and that happened in September. Probably still remember that we did the re-registration process a few years ago. Um, and all that data was then put onto an electronic system. And one of the things that we're going to continue to do is to just take out different grade levels each year to just continue to make sure that we're always charting that, making sure that we're checking those numbers, making sure those, those enrollments are correct, and we have the right populations here. But as Dr. Glaze was saying, when the monitor did do that report, we did match them up. And you know, we had a little screen with all those dots and all the addresses and you know we identified and made sure that that was not a concern very early on and, and I can tell you that I, I was one of the ones on the board and one of the board members that really pushed to identify before we started talking about expansion that all of our kids belong here because that's responsible you know we have to make sure and, and, and you know the numbers even then were not um, there were there were a few here and there but there, there were not a number that was staggering we were sitting here saying oh my god you know, that's, the, the number's never that high, but being responsible, we need to make sure that we're educating our kids and that the tax dollar is going to our kids because we're here, we're making a commitment. We're, we're looking for the outcomes here and, only, and, and we should make sure that those others that are, that everyone is in here for the same purpose. So, and, and I just want you to know that us before we monitor that and that's something that we put in place to make sure that the system and the process gets easier now. To do, it took a long time to get that set up. So, Any other questions? Just a quick one. The recurrent fees started family and now plan 
individuals, families, and homes, and children in the homes. And it is a formula that's been used in community after community to make these projections over time. Five years with really clear accuracy, and 10 years out with less accuracy. So it's um, based on that report, based on his, I mean, he's reported to the community several times and has gone back out several times to meet with the commissioners, to meet with, you know, developers and that kind of thing. His projection is that what we're doing solves the problem for 15 to 20 years. And again, because we're proactive, that's where the architects are planning spaces that are still with options to add on. So I'm so 
came on multi-purpose, and they wanted a separate cafeteria and a chip. And we had to tell them how to get one. So even though you, you're not getting one, they wanted to go ahead and design a unit. No, there's two minutes, right? We did one. We did one. We did one. We did one.
want to apologize for this stuff. And I do work here in the building, and I have to tell you, it's just been a wonderful place to work. The camaraderie among the teachers and the love for these students and the interaction with the parents is, is just so warm and, and loving. It, it truly is a wonderful place to work. And I thank you for all that you've done and presented this to us. Um, I have to say, I've been here six years. I've been in another school in town, and the town, this building has grown me in my six years tremendously by about a hundred or more students. Um, I found we did do the teacher's room and the teacher's room was also used for the students. There was a cooking club and a lot of activities for students here to take them out to let's say the pumpkin pie at Halloween and, and Thanksgiving. So that was lost, not only for the teachers but for the students. Um, and another consideration that I'd like to please consider is use of toilets for teachers. There are no, <laughs> there are very few toilets. We lost that in our teachers' room there's the bathroom. Uh, there's certainly one in the nurse's office that anyone, any teacher could use. And there's only two. One in the main office, and then there's two in what is now our teachers' room. Well, so you have the district office advocate for teachers. Okay, so I'm just going to show you. Will not be impinging upon existing classrooms. 